So welcome everyone. My name is Sally Cruzan and I am the coordinator of development and marketing here at Herring Gut Learning Center in Port Clyde, Maine. And please put in the, the chat where you're tuning in from tonight. It's always great to see um, where everyone is, is viewing from. And for those of you that don't know, Herring Gut Learning Center, we're an environmental education center uh, right at the end of the St. George Peninsula. And we're about um, a little bit over 20 year old organization. And we teach environmental science, ocean and climate literacy, uh, sustainability, aquaponics and aquaculture to uh, local school children. We also do um, education for teachers. So next week we'll be having a group of teachers right on our campus and we'll be teaching them how to create aquaponic systems in their classrooms and we'll be providing them with curriculum um, and support materials for that. And we also recently launched a really exciting new curriculum called Fresh to Salt, which is a watershed curriculum. And this particular uh, program is starting along the Kennebec watershed where we will be connecting inland students with coastal students and having them really learn about their behaviors in the environment on that same watershed, but in two different parts of the river. So it's really interesting. We're so excited and we plan on scaling this project out to all the, the major rivers in Maine and beyond. So keep an eye out for that. And we are a nonprofit organization, so we are always looking for your financial support. I would be remiss if I didn't say that. So um, thank you to all of those who have supported us in the past and those of you that will support us in the future. So tonight is a really great topic. Um, we have a special guest, Josie Islin, who will be talking to us about her book, The Curious World of Seaweed. Before we delve into that, we're going to talk about herring gut a little bit more because we always like to talk about um, in these programs, our Learn, Discover, Grow series, what is herring gut doing in regard to the topics that we're sharing with all of you? So tonight we have our educator, Patrick Burnham, who's going to start out the program. Patrick joined our team back in December so he is a marine science and aquaculture educator here at Herring Gut. And he um, joined us in December after spending several years on the West Coast. He is a graduate of the University of New England with a bachelor's of science in marine science. His experience includes teaching at a private school in Redlands, California, where he developed and taught STEM curriculum um, that was compliant with the next generation science standards for students in grades four through eight. And he was prior assistant program director at Catalina Island Marine Institute in Fox Landing um, in Catal Catalina Island, California. And during his tenure there, he led students on educational snorkels, uh, kayaks, hikes, and tide pool excursions. And he taught many classes on uh, marine mammals, the deep sea, uh, fisheries, marine debris, oceanography, plankton, island ecology, uh, astronomy, as well as labs on fish, sharks, and invertebrates. And Patrick is very skilled in accommodating a variety of learning styles, um, physical, mental, and behavioral disabilities and experience levels. So please come to campus this summer he has a lot of programs planned and we want you to have an opportunity to take advantage of that. If you have children, grandchildren, go to our website, look at our schedule um, and come to a program or just pop your head in the door and say, hello, um, Herring Gut is here for you and we want to get to know you a little bit better. And so now Patrick is going to talk a little bit about um, what we've taught our students here at Herring Gut about kelp and seaweed. So Patrick, take it away. Awesome. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, uh, Sally, for that really wonderful introduction. I feel like I learned something about myself, too, in that. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, it was really great. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight. Really excited. Um, this is kind of our, our kickoff to summer, our first event kind of in our 
summer months, which is really exciting. Next week, as Sally mentioned, we're um, diving right in, having lots of really fun, amazing programs, community programs. Um, if you're you know, close by, um, we're teaching some summer camps, summer schools with some local school districts, and uh, we'll be doing a couple more of these um, Learn, Discover, Grow adult series as we uh, progress through the summer. So join us for something. Um, all right, so I wanna chat quick about what Hair and Gut has done in the past um, and what we continue to do um, in kind of relation to our subject. And our subject today is the curious world of seaweed, which is really exciting. Seaweed is definitely one of those things that most people just say, ick, I don't like it when it touches me um, type of situation, but it's just such a fascinating, um, really fascinating organism um, that is really plays a huge part in how our world works. And we use it uh, as a curriculum all the time. Um, we've done algae presses with students. So we, I would go out and collect a whole bunch of algae from tide pools, uh, areas along the coast and bring it into the schools and have students you know, sort it out by different colors and different shapes, different sizes, a lot of tactile um, lessons. And then they get to uh, lay it out, do some kind of cool designs and we press it between pieces of paper and they get to kind of take something um, home with them. So that's something um, that we do fairly often with students. Um, and I want to bring up something that we have done in the past and haven't done recently, um, or at least since I have started at Hair and Gut. But it's a, one of the coolest programs that we've done. We've done it with um, some gifted and talented programs in the past with students. Um, we have, let me share my screen here. And and um, just my cover page here of our Curious World of Seaweed. So we have with students um, done kelp farming, done some aquaculture. Um, so using the water to grow something. And we have used sugar kelp here in Maine. We have really fun species of kelp, the biggest one being the sugar kelp. Uh, it doesn't grow as big as uh, West Coast species of kelp, but it's still, you know, vitally important here. Um, it also doesn't have as many air bladders, so it doesn't make as tall canopies as um, California or West Coast species do. Um, but it's really exciting. And this kelp farming spore to more was this book that this class um, was um, you know, kind of put together after their really amazing um, program that they did with us. So a little bit, they kind of did some intro on what sugar kelp is, um, Saccharina latissima there. And this is kind of what it looks like. It looks like giant brown lasagna noodles. Just kind of, you know, a really kind of cool descriptive um, term there. And we have grown them with our students which is really fun. Um, they put this book together. The slides from now on are from the book of, um, that the students put together is they have, you know, they did background information, background research into why sugar kelp is, you know, important and what it is, where it grows, why it grows here, all these things. They did a lot of really great things. The ideal depth of where it should grow is 30 meters, um, how big it can get. Uh, all these really exciting things. Um, they even went into, you know, understanding the different parts of seaweed and how the parts of a seaweed differs from the parts of plants. So where you have blades, hold fast, um, stipe and a float are different than roots, trunk, leaves, branches from a plant counterpart, um, which is really exciting. They went into the different life cycles of the kelp from here where you have adult kelp and then they release spores and then those spores uh, make juveniles and then they can grow up from there, which is really exciting. 
They also learn how to take the spores off of mature kelp um, and then cultivate it in our labs, which is a really interesting process because you have to have clean filtered seawater and you know no bacteria in there or no other things in there to kind of outcompete. Um, the students took PVC pipes and spooled rope on them so that when it was time to actually put it in the water, the spool could just come out and it was ready to go. It was really cool. They had to use fertilizers, um, add air bubbles and make sure everything was timed uh, really well. And they also had to go and put all this stuff out in the farm, design their kelp farm and how it was going to work. Luckily, Heron Gut has a really amazing uh, lobster pound on our facility. So we have a really nice kind of controlled area to grow these things. We don't have to go really far offshore or, you know, where wind or anything is going to be a danger to these students. And this is in our lobster pound. They did all have to do this in the wintertime. Kelp grows um, in the wintertime. So a lot of these pictures of the students in the dinghies out in our lobster pound are, you can see they're wearing hats. So it can get a little cold sometimes. So they did have some, some fun weather there. Um, and then to kind of wrap up their project after they had grown their kelp for the season, they came up with uses for that kelp. So this is just a couple of examples of some recipes so of edible ways to use um, their seaweed, kelp smoothies, um, infused tomato soup. They also came up with lotions um, and uh, face masks, lip balms, dark chocolate, kelp ice cream. Oh, that sounds like fun. Um, jerky. Um, so they did a really, really great job um, with that. Uh, with that program. And it's something that we've done with kids, uh, with kiddos before, something that, you know, we'd love to do more of. Um, and yeah, so if you ever have any interest, if you ever come down to Hair and Gut, ask about this book. We have a bunch of copies and you can, you know, take a look at the recipes and what the kids did. Um, it's really fun. All right. So now I'm going to pass the baton, as it were, um, over to our main speaker of the evening. She's going to start out with uh, a really amazing three minute video from her website about kind of the intro, what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the evening. So Josie, thank you so much for being here. And it's all you. Sally, did you want to say anything or should I just go ahead? Let me, let me do just a quick a quick intro to um, just so sorry. give a little bit more background. Not a problem, Patrick, at all. And um, I want to talk about the kelp chocolate ice cream. That was a big <laughs> hit. The kelp jerky, not so much. Um, it was awful, but it was a good try. They, they liked um, making the recipe. So our guest speaker, as, um, as you all know, is Josie Islin, and Josie is the author of numerous books combining the art and science of our oceans. Uh, the book that she'll be talking about tonight, The Curious World of Seaweed, was released back in August 2019, and she holds a BA in Visual and Environmental Studies from Harvard and an MFA from San Francisco State University. Her writing and art focused on seaweed, kelp, and sea otter, put her on the forefront of ocean activism, collaborating with scientists and groups, working to preserve the kelp forest of our Pacific coast through art, design, and research. Josie celebrates the marine flora and brings thoughtfulness and stewardship to the realms of our oceans. So Josie, we'll start out with a, a brief video and then we'll um, proceed into her discussion and please uh, feel free in the chat if you all have any questions we'll be reading them um, along the way or at the end of the presentation and we'll try to get all those answered for you so thank you Josie take it away seaweeds and kelp are some of the great eco engineers of our planet they are photosynthesizing powerhouses, growing rapidly in cold waters, creating the base of the vast ocean food chain. Kelp and seaweeds provide crucial habitat for countless other organisms, both tiny and large. 
They sink carbon and oxygenate their nearshore waters. Marine algae, another name for seaweed, are essential and also spectacularly beautiful. Their stories are compelling and important and deserve to be told with more than words. My newest book, The Curious World of Seaweed, begins like this. The thin region where the sea meets the land is unlike either land or sea. It is betwixt and between, a threshold from one state to another. It is a linear point or a coastal ribbon, a place of dramatic change and remarkable abundance, abundance of life and also of possibility. From the ocean's perspective, the approach to the world's great land masses is from the deep and dark pelagic up over a continental shelf into a dim region where light barely penetrates the water and on up into a brighter photic zone, what might be called the subtidal and continues into the low intertidal where the extreme full moon tides pull away the water once or twice a month and up towards the beach or rocky reef where the ocean swells in and out in six hour cycles and up finally to the highest tide mark, the rack line where the ocean leaves its debris to mark a final encroachment towards dry land. This sliver of ocean, where sunlight penetrates enough to allow photosynthesis to work its magic, and where the benthos, or ocean bottom, provides something to hold on to, is the home of the seaweeds, or marine algae. The Pacific Ocean's edge, where it encounters the North American continent, is considered one of the richest of these rich zones. This slice of ocean from Alaska to Baja, California in Mexico has some of the most diverse and abundant seaweeds and kelps on earth. The rocky fog shrouded coast sports a spectacular number of seaweed species from enormous kelps to tiny corallines. The portraits and artwork made using my flatbed scanner have taken me deep into the world of seaweed, initiating a journey into scientific storytelling, ocean advocacy, and algal empathy. I hope you might come with me. Thank you all. Um, so much. Uh, I'm delighted, delighted to be here. Uh, so I'm here on Vinyl Haven Island, and um, I, um, but most, but I'm, I'm based in San Francisco. And um, so what I hope to do today is kind of bring some of um, both coasts together in really celebrating the world of the seaweed. And as um, Sally mentioned, I'm, I'm I've become, moved from being an artist uh, to a writer to really being an advocate for the world of the marine flora um, that uh, is really so important. And that's what that video, uh, the, the, when COVID came, I actually had the opportunity to make that video as all these events had been, um, uh, had been canceled. So now I'm gonna take you through my talk that really takes you through my journey as an artist into the world of the seaweeds. And um, at the end, we should have plenty of time for questions. So please write your questions into the um, chat and we will um, have time, plenty of time to answer them as I said there. Um, so let me go like this. Um, and I'm, um, so, um, so I, uh, sorry, I'm just, um, um, so my, as I said, my kind of goal is to use the power of imagery to bring the world of marine algae to as broad an audience as possible. So my goal and herring guts, you know, kind of mission really mesh together. And I, I can't say enough about uh, how much I'm inspired by what herring gut is doing and the imagination they are bringing to getting children involved with the marine sciences. Um, I've been teaching a few um, uh, high school courses and I think it's really important to get this marine science into the biology curriculums as much as early and as often uh, as possible. Um, 
happening there. This is not seem to let me see what is happening here. Um, so I have been using uh, my flatbed scanner for many, many years. And one of the ways I've been able to get um, the, the seaweeds out to this kind of other audience is I've been printing onto these big curtain, this curtain material. This is actually ripstop. This is an installation uh, at Al on Alameda in the East Bay in Oakland, and it's for a gallery situation. Um, so these are 94 inches high. Uh, what you have is the great erythrophyllum on the left, the feather boa kelp, which is in the middle, and the palmaria, and then the macrocystis or giant kelp on the far right. Um, so these are all West Coast seaweeds, but the palmaria is just the West Coast version of the dulse um, that you that we have here on the on the East Coast. Um, this was I was asked as an artist to um, do something with some storefronts for a very underused shopping center. And this was a video store that had needless to say been abandoned for a number of years. Um, and so this the Alameda Arts Commission uh, asked a bunch of us artists to enliven the storefronts. Uh, so this is that image of the great macrocystis or bull kelp um, that is um, the, um, the dominant uh, kelp that makes up the kelp forest of Southern California. And as you can see, I've put it in the window there. This is the outside view of another portion of this shopping center area. What you have is the Neriocystis lutkiana or bull kelp on the left and then the palmaria on the right. So around these windows, there were children's performances, there were musical performance, there was dancing, there were food trucks. So there were people encountering these organisms, these images of the seaweeds that really would not, they, they are not scuba divers, they are not snorkelers. Um, you can't hike into the kelp forest the way you can uh, our other, our terrestrial forests. And that is one of the great challenges with bringing these uh, remarkably beautiful and important organisms to kind of the broader audience. I love it when I get to partner with the scientists directly. And so this was an installation for the Northeast Algal Society's uh, conference in New Haven in 2018, uh, where they asked me as an artist to come and enliven this gallery space on the campus of the University of New Hampshire where the conference was going on. And their mantra or their, their, for, for that particular meeting was broaden your impact. And what I found is that the seaweed scientists, the phycologists as they're called, are actually really enthusiastic uh, for my participation as an artist um, because they're, they, they want their passion for the seaweeds to communicate to audiences beyond the people in their scientific papers. And this was a wonderful way to have a gathering before the conference about all the research they were doing and we could meet in the gallery. And um, then I did a presentation there. What you have on the right here is the cytosiphon is this wonderful brown seaweed that's really sausage like, and then the great sea grapes there. Again, these are these curtains that I have found to be incredibly versatile uh, in terms of using them in different kinds of spaces. Um, so, so that's been a, a great way. I have them fabricated right in South San Francisco with a local fabricator. Um, and the other really fun thing about that particular exhibit was that I partnered with one of the scientists who was running it and had these big prints made uh, right from his science lab. So the idea that we could have fine art prints made from a science lab all it meant was we shifted out our papers um, from his printer was really, was really wonderful and people and the prints were beautiful. So how is it that I make these prints? Well, I use my scanner. So if I were at home in my studio in San Francisco, I would be sitting right next to this scanner. Um, and, um, but I'm here uh, showing you a picture of my studio in San Francisco and this scanner, I've had this scanner probably for about, oh, 12 years. Um, and it's a diehard uh, piece of equipment. It's really my tool of choice. Um, if I'm scanning something that's opaque, like those stones, I will leave the top open like this and um, the background will default to black. But if I'm scanning the seaweeds and I wanna capture that wonderful translucence and color, um, I um, take uh, this white cover off the top there uh, and that top lid is actually the transparency adapter. 
And the transparency adapter has a second light element. There's another piece of glass up there and a light element. And I'll close that lid down. Uh, and I might use those helper stones um, to help me. And, um, and uh, that second light element will push light through the specimen uh, and capture that wonderful translucence and brilliant color. Uh, I have a piece of praeonitis in there. Uh, but um, what you have here on the left is one of the straight ahead portraits that my scanner has been so, uh, such a fabulous tool for me to, to create these portraits of the marine algae or these intertidal heroes, as I sometimes call them, the seaweed. Um, and the beautiful thing about this scanner is that the color is very true. Um, and you know, if you've tried to photograph with cameras, it's really hard to get true color depending on the conditions you're in. Well, the scanner is very systematic in terms of the, the color. So this is really the color of this beautiful erythrophyllum or featherweed as it's sometimes called. And you can see I've scanned this specimen when it's a little bit wet. You can see some of the ocean is there um, uh, with it. You can see in those bubbles. Um, this, the, this is the technique I used to make my first full book on marine algae called um, An Ocean Garden, The Secret Life of Seaweed. And that was published in 2014 and is what I would call a visual primer on seaweed. It's got these straight ahead portraits that are designed very graphically on the page. And then I've written as lyrically as I can the very basic science of the seaweeds. Um, as I've progressed as an artist, I have explored these more complex collaged um, uh, pieces that have some abstraction going on. I'm using multiple specimens with slightly different colors. Uh, and that's been really exciting for me. This is a wonderful seaweed we have uh, in California. When you come out to the rocky reef um, there, you will certainly in the springtime notice these little fingers uh, that grow up to be about six inches tall out of the reef uh, the, from the rocks. And these are called sea sacs or halosachion. Uh, and the sea sacs have actually taken a different approach to survival in the intertidal zone. And as you know, from being on the beach, you have watched the rockweed, the ascophyllum that we have so much of right here in the Gulf of Maine. You watch it transform every six hours just from the low tide to the high tide. I mean, it's unbelievable how dried out, especially on these super hot days, um, how dried out it gets. And yet once the tide comes back in, it rises up into its voluminous self and is as fresh as it always has been. Well, these little halosachion take a slightly different approach to survival during that drying uh, phase of low tide, and that is to hydrate from within. So they keep whole little oceans um, of, 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 of oh, seawater inside of them, and they have pores up at the top uh, that let them take uh, the ocean in and out. Uh, so they're actually, yeah, they're um, halosachion or sea sacs. So this is the feather boa kelp. This is a really iconic kelp of the California coast. It is so wacky and so different from anything that we really recognize from our terrestrial world um, that this was the, the species that I, I wrote an essay called Empathy for a Kelp. And I attempted to write the life history of the feather boa kelp in such a way that we could feel empathy for this organism that is so different from anything that we can relate to. Um, it doesn't have a trunk. It doesn't have to deal with gravity. Um, the seaweeds um, don't devote energy to woody um, structures. Uh, they, they get to float in the buoyancy of the ocean water. Uh, this has one float on it. Anyway, so feather bow is a real favorite of mine. And uh, at one uh, juncture, I took great uh, inspiration as an artist from a local San Francisco artist named Rex Ray, um, who was really masterful at cutting out organic or pieces of paper that he had made, patterned paper that he had made, and he would cut them into these organic shapes and make these fantastic collages with them. And I thought, wow, maybe I can collage myself um, using the blades of the egregia or the, or the different species that I was collecting and, and 
building these abstractions. I had also just seen a, a fantastic exhibit at the museum that was about how Richard Diebenkorn had been copying uh, Matisse and, and the show showed the Diebenkorn paintings alongside the Matisse paintings. And it gave me inspiration as an artist to go out there and copy somebody. Um, it, it's always gonna be my own work, uh, but Rex Ray was really that, that artist that I um, really sort of paid homage to uh, and, and was copying in a way. Now, another artist that I've been very, very um, uh, kind of inspired by and wanting to pay homage to is a woman named Anna Atkins. And you might've heard of her, she's gotten quite a lot of press uh, and play in the last few years. Uh, but when I started researching her in 2009 for my first book, um, Beach, a Book of Treasure, um, the, I could, it was very hard to find information about her. But she was, in fact, um, she created the very first photographically illustrated book. And the photographs she made were these cyanotype prints, which are basically sun prints. It's where um, your paper is coated with a light sensitive emulsion. Uh, and then you can expose that paper uh, out in the sunlight with a specimen on top of it shading the paper and where the specimen is, uh, it gets washed out to white. So in honor of Anna Atkins, I decided I need to start making, needed to start making some cyanotype prints myself in my backyard. Uh, so here you have those cytosiphons on the right uh, and a um, kind of combination of images of, of cyanotypes on the left there. Um, and then I started thinking about the cyanotype process as a historical photographic process and realized that there is this lineage of what's called nature printing. Um, and nature printing is a process whereby one is making a print from the specimen itself. It's not through an intermediary um, hand like a botanical illustration or a lens as in through a photograph. It's where the specimen itself is making the print and the cyanotype technique is a nature print. You're putting that specimen right there onto your emulsion and exposing it out in the sunlight and washing it out in water. And I realized that my scanner is actually working in that same lineage. I'm, I am imaging directly from my specimens. So then I thought, well, maybe I can put my, my scans right into its cyanotype shadow. And that's what this is. This is the first image I made in this regard. I made these twin, this kind of diptych uh, cyanotype of this seaweed is, uh, is Pikea Californ Californica, a beautiful red seaweed. Um, and, um, and I realized that this kind of dialogue between the seaweed and its shadow uh, had also this, a little bit of a dialogue across time in that the, the cyanotype is kind of a historical process, even though I was making it. So this is really where my designer's eye uh, really has so much fun. This is a wonderful red seaweed, very red seaweed, called Apuntiella. And this was picked up off the beach at uh, Limitor Beach on Point Reyes. So I hope you all have been to California and been to Point Reyes National Seashore. Um, and there is a, a kelp patch I visit very, very often. And, uh, there's certain places where the, the seaweeds collect and this was picked up off of one of those places. So this is the cover of An Ocean Garden, The Secret Life of Seaweed, which um, was my, as I said, my visual primer on seaweed. I actually have all the copies left. So if you need a copy of this book, you can go to my website and you can order it from there and I'll send it to you. Um, but after I was done with this very straight ahead treatment of the seaweeds, I, I needed to continue. Um, and that's when my journey into this next book, The Curious World of Seaweed, uh, began. And um, what, I, what I started researching was some of the history of the naming, some of the history of the science behind the sea, what we know about seaweeds. And part, the history of the science involves taxonomy. And taxonomy is, is the naming process for organisms of our world, of our natural world. Um, and the categorizing of it. And what I realized was that, tax, that the taxonomic record of our seaweeds, especially of those on our West Coast that I was researching, has this wonderful visual component to it. And that I could, in fact, kind of play around with that taxonomic record. So what you have here are four historical lithographs 
that were part of an 1853 publication that was um, published uh, by um, Johann uh, Ruprecht. And Ruprecht was a botanist in Russia. He was actually German, but he was in Russia. And he was naming some of these first California seaweeds that were collected by this other Russian and sent back to Russia to be described and named. And there were these fantastic lithographs in that folio that would fold out into these five foot long, um, incredible images. So I was able to scan those. And then I um, started playing around with combining my contemporary scans with those uh, historical images. Um, and that's what you have here. This is Costaria costata, uh, which is a cousin to the Dictyodorum californicum. Um, and so I have the, I can, I can kind of play around with color and, well, these are all the, the straight on colors of the actual specimens. This is the layering of, um, of a porphyra or, or nori um, as, it's, as it's best known onto the lithograph and it's my scan of the brownish nori uh, overlaid with a lithograph by the great Alexander Postels. And Alexander Postels was a fantastic botanical illustrator who focused on the seaweeds and kelps that were collected from an exploratory expedition in 1829 uh, to Alaska. So um, he became, he was, he, they didn't even know he was really good at illustrating until he started on board the ship um, to illustrate the seaweeds. And these sketches, they, he went back to Russia and he paired up with that guy Ruprecht and they made this folio called Illustraciones Algarum. It has these fantastic oversized images of the seaweeds. So again, I those and overlay my scans onto them. So the porphyra that you just saw is super common in all of our world's oceans. We have it here in Penobscot Bay, uh, up and down the main coast. Uh, in Nori, um, there are many different species of the pyropia or porphyra. Um, and this is another one that's really common and I hope that you recognize it. It's sea lettuce or ulva. And sea lettuce is again, one of what's called a cosmopolitan seaweed, which means that it, it lives in all of the world's oceans. And again, I've overlaid it onto one of the great lithographs by Alexander Postels. Um, and now again, I'm, I'm back to playing with one of those lithographs by Ruprecht from his 1853 folio. And this is a wonderful kelp or kind of a rack uh, in California known as beaded chain rack. And you can see those beaded bladder. It's almost like those pop beads um, that your grandkids or your children play with or did play with a long time ago. Um, uh, and um, this rack is very, very common on our California beaches. So this image, uh, and I played with the lithograph and kind of shifted it to blue. Uh, so it would offset the golden uh, color of the of this um, kelp that's called Stephano, its Latin name is Stephanocystis osmundacea. And um, that those bottom blades are very similar to the osmunda fern. So that's why it has that osmundacea. And this was used, this image was taken up by the designer at Heyday Books uh, to use as the cover of The Curious World of Seaweed. Um, and so I have a wonderful time as I'm writing these books and building the imagery, I'm actually designing the books as I go along. Um, and so I'm able to send my publisher a very, a pretty good rough layout of the book uh, and then they refine it. And in this case, they chose which image was to make the cover and they made this fantastic cover. I really hope you get a hold of a copy of the book. I know Sherman's is selling it in Damascata. Um, it's a beautiful book in the hand. Um, it's also available on audiobooks, and uh, it is yours truly who's reading it. So I really do, if that's how you like to uh, listen or take in your books, um, then absolutely. So these are the 16 chapters. And what I try to do with this book is really keep focused on the seaweeds themselves, keep it algal centric. So each chapter is the life story of each particular, these 16 iconic uh, California or, or West Coast, Pacific Coast seaweeds. Many of them also cross over into um, the Atlantic and all around the world. Um, and I also am able to bring in a whole lot of history with that. Um, but what I want to point out here is this is 16 of 
a, a, a it's just a tiny fraction of what is actually out there. Um, and we have actually quite a, a broader range of seaweeds on the West Coast than you do here that might have to do with glaciation. Um, but there is this enormous biodiversity of the seaweeds wherever we are, and they need to be celebrated. Um, and so that 16 is just of, I think the California flora of California alone has 750 species at least in it. Um, there are, I think, 6,000 uh, species of red seaweed, um, many thousands of green and of brown. So, um, so I want to take you to our California coast for just a little bit and really kind of explain why we are one of the richest of these rich zones. And what we're talking about is this slender section of the ocean that's close enough to the coast that uh, sunlight can penetrate for photosynthesis. Um, and, uh, but it's where um, nutrients can be taken up by the seaweeds themselves because unlike our plants on land that need to get their nutrients from roots, uh, the seaweeds get their nutrients directly into the cells of the blades of the seaweed. And what I'm showing you here is a, a, a springtime shot of Northern California. This is Mendocino, the Mendocino coast and the winds clock around um, to the, the um, Northwest and these prevailing winds are really dynamic and they're pushing the surface waters of the ocean away uh, so that this deep upwelling can happen. And the another difference between our west coast and here on the east coast is that we have the continental shelf pretty close to the coastline. Uh, so these deep waters uh, come up to replace those surface waters and that deep water is full of nutrients. Not only is it cold, which is super important, uh, but it's full of nutrients and cold water uh, can hold more nutrients more densely. And that's what our seaweeds need for all of their very robust growth. Um, and this is the kind of rack you might find. And so what I wanna point out here is when you find that rack, um, whether it wash, I found this fantastic pile of rack over here. I was walking on Lanes Island in Vinyl Haven. If you come over to Vinyl Haven, which I hope you do, that's just an easy day walk is you go around Lanes Island and there was this fantastic pile of rack that was almost as big as this. And it was mostly Chondrus crispus or Irish moss. Um, and these piles of rack, instead of kind of going, ew, I want you to think about all of the organisms that are helping it to decompose uh, that are the um, kelp flies and the isopods and, and the fleas all around it. Well, those are helping it decompose and think about the nutrients that those create for bird populations and especially migrating birds. Uh, that is protein, that is an absolute feast that is essential for shorebirds. So this kind of ecology is really important for transferring some of this incredible richness uh, from the ocean up to the nearshore ecologies and then up even farther. And I wanna point out how important these kelp forests are to eagle populations, Osprey, um, because the, associated with all this richness are fish um, and nesting materials. Uh, so the kelp forest isn't isolated. It is connected to these nearshore ecologies. Um, so if we go in a little bit closer, you'll see this incredible array of color here. And we have red, we have gold, we have green, we have text, different textures in here. Um, and so now I wanna take us a little bit into a little bit of the science of the seaweed and um, get a little bit nerdy if that's okay. And uh, Patrick um, mentioned this, the different colors of the seaweeds. And I think it's just so fantastic that herring gut is starting to teach this to quite young kids. Um, again, I'm gonna reiterate how important it is that the basic high school biology curriculum has good marine science to explain some of the basic uh, foundational um, biologies. Because that way the marine science kind of isn't thought of as this offshoot, as something kind of separate from um, the basic biology curriculum. Excuse me. So here you have the red, the green, and the brown seaweeds. And that's what we saw just in that last, in real life, you see it out here, but here it is uh, made on my scanner. So starting with the green, the green seaweeds are full of just chlorophyll A and B. 
um, and that chlorophyll drives photosynthesis. It's in the plastids of these, um, uh, these all of the seaweeds, um, but green, the greens just have chlorophyll in their, uh, in their plastids, in their chloroplasts. And so it is this intense green. So when you're out on the beach and if it's low tide, it might be plastered to a rock, but see if you can get it in some water and you hold up some of that sea lettuce, which you have here, it is really Kelly green. And that is because it's just chlorophyll. Uh, and there's chlorophyll in, there's, it's only two cells thick and there's, every cell is able to collect uh, light to perform photosynthesis and every cell is able to collect nutrients from the ocean. So then you go to the reds and the reds have um, accessory pigments in their plastids or chloroplasts. And those accessory pigments, and there's a red accessory pigment and a blue accessory pigment. And those are designed to collect different wavelengths of light. Because again, I want us to remember that the red daylight that is prevalent all around us that we assume is kind of just the default is really very specific. Daylight falls heavily in the red spectrum, which has a very specific wavelength. Well, that wavelength of light doesn't necessarily penetrate the ocean very well. So the red seaweeds have developed this way to collect different wavelengths of light. The blue, um, the blue and um, red accessory pigments collect green and violet or other, other wavelengths of, of light that penetrate the ocean, the water. Um, and those uh, accessory pigments come together, the red and the, the blue to make these incredible array of pink, magenta, purple, uh, and this array of colors you find in the red category. So the reds and the greens are two um, separate evolutionary lineages of seaweeds that go way, 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 way back to the cyanobacteria as a common ancestor. The brown seaweeds on the other hand evolved much, much later and they have a brown accessory pigment in their uh, chloroplasts to, um, uh, and, and the, the brown accessory pigment mixes with the green chlorophyll to make these beautiful shades of gold and, and olive and uh, brown, deep brown. Now the, the kelps fall into the brown category and the kelps are those more complex seaweeds that have bladders. Um, some of them don't, uh, but if it has a bladder, it is definitely a kelp. So I have a whole chapter on color in uh, The Curious World of Seaweed. Um, and this is the uh, species that, um, the signature species that I use to discuss that. This is Maziella volans. And when it dries, it dries to this incredible purple, which is this kind of ultimate um, combination of the red and the blue pigments coming together. And I've placed it in here in the cyanotype uh, that I've made it. So what I thought I'd do is take you through kind of the life and times of, of a particular kelp. And this kelp is really kind of an iconic kelp of our Northern California coast. And its story uh, is a little bit emblematic of a lot of the situation in kelp forests all over the world in that they are struggling. Um, warming oceans and all sorts of different conditions are putting stressors on our kelp. And we, the resilience, what we have to understand is that as humans, we have been mining resilience out of our ocean ecologies. We've been pulling the resilience out. So its ability to rebound from stressor events is getting harder and harder. So it's a beautiful, beautiful kelp. These are two juvenile Neriocystis lutkianas or bull kelp. Uh, this is a great kelp to learn uh, those parts that Patrick mentioned there. You have the holdfast, you have this wiggly stipe um, that has to be very um, uh, dynamic in uh, the, the wave action because the bull kelp typically lives in a very um, out where there is a lot of wave action in the in pretty rough waters. The bladder is gas filled bladder that is holding these blades up um, to the ocean surface so that uh, the blades, as we call them here, the fronds or blades, uh, they're not leaves, uh, can um, photosynthesize as efficiently as possible. Um, this is a scan that I made on the left and I've combined it with this wonderful lithograph by Alexander Postels and this kind of jazzy like rambunctiousness of these kelps I think is, is kind of wonderful. Um, we both were struggling, how do we contain this Rococo thing, this flamboyant uh, organism to the square of a page or the square platen of my scanner. And we both came up with these similar solutions, even though 
the connection came up later. So here's a baby, two baby bull kelps. These are historical pressings. And this book, my new book is full of historical pressings alongside my own contemporary scans. And the bull kelp starts um, in the early spring, late winter, early spring as a tiny little kelp, um, just a few inches tall where its bladder is only about as big as my thumbnail. Um, and in a matter of months, um, the uh, big majestic bull kelp will grow into this. Um, and this can be 60 feet uh, tall. Um, the bladder can be six inches. It's thick, like it can have a rind as thick as a you know, big lemon. Um, and it has these, can have 64 uh, blades at least um, flowing out of it. So it is a pretty massive thing. And all of this biomass is generated in a matter of months between March and July. And this is all the power of photosynthesis and the nutrients in these cold ocean waters. Um, so I can't stress that much, how much this, this is primary production. This is primary production at its like most um, fantastic. Um, and this is what the bull kelp forest looks like in the water. These are photographs by a wonderful photographer named Marco Maza. And um, he, uh, you can see this is probably spring, late spring. And these bulbs are really holding the bladders up towards the surface where the blades can get to that sunlight. But interest, really interesting thing about the bull kelp is that it is an annual. It performs its old, whole cycle in one year um, so that it has to reproduce by the time the winter storms um, come in and wash uh, the kelp away. Um, so these are sori patches which are actually uh, spore patches. And these patches, by the, they, they start developing in the late summer or maybe middle of August. And by late summer, early fall, they fall away from the blades of the kelp uh, to the bottom. And these patches can have millions and millions of spores on them. Um, so this is, um, was uh, taken on a snorkeling trip up in Mendocino a couple of years ago. And you can see how the spore patches have started to fall away and it leaves these kind of tattered um, blades that are kind of like your cookie dough after you've cut out the cookies. Um, and again, these spore patches, the, the bull kelp, because it's an annual, its strategy is to just pump out millions and almost billions of spores. These spore patches settle on the bottom and the spores are released and they evolve into an alternate generation. And the life cycles of the kelp is very complicated. Uh, I noticed Patrick kind of glossed over it there. We all kind of gloss over it. But it's important to know that there's an alternate generation that these spores evolve into both an egg and a sperm, a, a, a male and a female organism. And these male and female organisms are microscopic and uh, under the ocean floor. And those male and female organisms actually release egg and sperm and those egg and sperm find each other and um, fertilize. And that fertilized, um, uh, organism grows into the great sporophyte or bull kelp that we know. So this is the, in that same area in Van Dam where I was snorkeling and this was taken in 2008. And what I've learned most recently is that the bull kelp grows in these uh, three year boom and bust cycles. And this was an absolute boom year. Um, it happened to be when um, urchin, um, uh, this was in 2008 and there was an urchin fishery. There is an urchin fishery in California um, that the red urchin uh, were being heavily fished here. So that left the kelp to go um, uh, really wild. Um, and it, I wanna point out that there was a fishery of urchins in Penobscot Bay or in the Gulf of Maine uh, that also followed the sushi cycle. Um, and those urchins got kind of fished out. But I'll come back to that and I'll clarify that maybe even in some questions. But this is an enormous amount of biomass. This is just an epic, epic kelp year. Um, I was out in that same kelp patch in 2017. So that was 2008. In 2017, this was the kelp patch, lots of water around it, around the, the kelps. This is how the bull kelp look in a great, in a bed by the middle of summer. The bulbs have gotten the whole tubular end kind of lays, splays out across the surface of the ocean. Um, and so these are some real, mature ones, this was the end of August. Um, and then two years later in 2019, this was 2017, in 2019, uh, I think it was September, I was going back up 
uh, to Mendocino to do a talk on um, the kelp. And I stopped at Van Dam at that same place. And this is what I saw. There was no kelp, no kelp at all. And I went back this year, I've been back a number of times, even through COVID, um, I've been able to go up to the kelp forest, you know, stay by myself, mask up when I'm around people and um, have been able to kind of keep tabs on what's happening in the kelp forest on the North Coast. And, and this, is, this is the problem. There is really no kelp left here. So what has been happening? And I'll be kind of quick here so we can get back to some of the prettier things. But I just want to show you this because it's the same dynamic that happens in the Gulf of Maine where you have these herbivorous urchins. Um, and in the Gulf of Maine, you have green urchins, uh, but in California, we have two colors of urchins. We have red urchins and we have purple urchins. And what you see here are the purple urchins taking a perfectly healthy bull kelp, like you see on the left, and pinning it to a vertical rock face and devouring the blades. And once they devour the blades, they'll then devour the, um, the whole bulb and all the way down the stipe. Um, they are very voracious herbivores. And what happened in about 2015 is that one of the predators of the urchins that kept the population in control was this voracious um, urchin hunting starfish called Pycnopodia and, or sunflower sea star. And these are these big 20 armed sea stars that are deep water sea stars that are, can move quite quickly and were really good, not only at just um, hunting and, and eating the, the urchins, but keeping the urchins scared uh, in their crevices and cracks, uh, much like the wolves of Yellowstone acted with the elk in that they would kill some of the elk, but they actually were scaring the elk uh, to move them away from eating the elk being the herbivores in this case uh, that were eating all the um, willow trees along the banks of the rivers in the Yellowstone, in Yellowstone. So same dynamic here, you have this voracious herbivore and the primary producer, the kelp. And we lost, we had a um, terrible event in 2015 where the West Coast had what's called starfish wasting disease. And this disease decimated all of the starfish populations. Um, over the course of two years, all of the starfish on the West Coast disappeared. Um, and the, uh, the intertidal starfish have come back in, voracious, in, in fine form, but that hunter um, sunflower starfish has not returned. And it has been estimated recently that over 5 billion of these starfish organisms, the Pycnopodia, disappeared from the waters of uh, the West Coast. So what that did was release the urchins from predation and they all came out of their cracks. Uh, there could have been a, um, a spawning event because the waters were also warm at the same time. We had a couple of warm water events that created this perfect storm of stressors for the kelp. And this is called an urchin barren. So kelp forests and urchin barrens are these two different regimes that are common throughout the world here in the Gulf of Maine, Southern Australia, um, um, all over the world. And that's where you enough stress comes, the balance of the kelp forest gets tipped and too many urchins are in the mix uh, without, in this case, without the predators and they eat down all the kelp. Uh, and it's very hard to, to get the, the system to tip back towards the kelp forest. Um, they're, they're both legitimate regimes, but the kelp forest is a much richer um, regime. And one of the issues with the Pycnopodia, the sunflower star being lost to the starfish wasting disease was that the other top predator uh, in our Northern California system uh, and throughout California is the sea otter. And there are no sea otter in Northern California. Now, if you've been to Central California and you've been to Monterey and you've been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, you've seen the sea otter there and they most often will be eating the sea urchin. They're voracious urchin predators. Uh, they have a very, very high metabolism. Um, they're the smallest marine mammal, but they have no blubber. Unlike the seals uh, and whales and orcas, um, they have no blubber. So it is their pelt and this supercharged metabolism that keeps them warm in the cold Pacific waters. So they were killed off uh, with the fur trade. By 1900, there were no more sea otter up and down the coast. Uh, and there have not been sea otter um, from the Golden Gate Bridge all the way through Northern California, Oregon. And then you get some uh, halfway up the Washington coast. Um, 
so here's just a little, um, a little um, diagram of the trophic cascade, whereby you have these carnivores, the, the starfish and the otter, and they keep those herbivores in check. And that lets a healthy primary producer, in this case, uh, bull kelp, or if you were here, it would be uh, the, the um, laminaria, the saccharina, uh, the sugar kelp. Um, and if you have no otter or sunflower stars on our west coast, then these purple urchins take over. And the purple urchins have never had a fishery. They've not been commercially viable. Um, and so they have not been taken care of by us humans. And therefore you, we've had, we have this huge um, catastrophe of our kelp forests. Now here on the main coast in the early, in the, in the 90s, uh, with the advent of sushi becoming very um, uh, popular and a great price uh, was on the gonads of the urchins, which is what uni is. If you go to a sushi restaurant and you have uni, that is the urchin gonad. And the green urchins of, of the Gulf of Maine became very prized and very valuable. So there was really kind of a gold rush on to, for divers to go collect green urchin. Um, and they had viability uh, on the marketplace and they were fished out. Um, and so that is why you don't have too many urch green urchins anymore here, but you do have a much healthier uh, kelp forest here in the Gulf of Maine. The regime shifted to be kelp dominant, which in general is a richer uh, ecology. There's much more biodiversity. There's usually better fish populations in the kelp forest uh, than an urchin barren. Um, more prey can hide from predators. Um, those top um, predators can come in and search for prey. Um, so, so this is my piece that is kind of an homage to these disappearing kelp forests on our Northern California coast. Um, this is my bull kelp that I've kind of turned ghostly combined with this fantastic um, uh, lithograph by Alexander Postels. So that kind of wraps up uh, the, um, the, the otter urchin kelp story. But there's, a, there's kind of a coda to the otter story, which I think is just really interesting in terms of us thinking about how do we be activists in terms of helping these ecologies that are very complex. And one of the points is that we don't know what will happen um, in the future. <laughs> so one of the things that happened on the California coast was that otter, those otter of the central coast, kind of migrated into a slough, an estuary called the Elkhorn Slough. And the otter started eating the crab. Not only do they eat urchin, but they also eat crab. And that the crab in the Elkhorn Slough had been having a very detrimental effect on the eelgrass there. So the Elkhorn Slough is an estuary where the marine grasses are really important, like so many estuaries all over the world. And this is um, Zostra Marina and Zostra Marina's eelgrass. And it's, it's as important as the kelp forests um, because it sinks carbon, it sequesters carbon. Uh, it is an eco-engineer in that it's creating habitat for herring row and um, all the larval uh, nurseries that are needed for the invertebrates to, to develop to maturity. Um, it's, it's just a, a, foundational, a foundational ecology. Um, but in the Elkhorn Slough, there's actually a lot of agriculture all around the, eel, the, the slough. So that eutrophication, that over nutrification was making quite a lot of algae grow, which is very typical all over the world for the algae to suffer. I mean, the, the eelgrass to suffer from over nutrification from runoff, agricultural runoff fertilizers and such. That what that means is that the algae too much like algal muck is growing on the blades of the eelgrass so that it can't photosynthesize and it eventually kind of withers and dies. But what happened when the, when the um, otter migrated back into the estuary there, it was found over about a decade that the eelgrass was thriving and expanding. And a few scientists, uh, a guy named Brent Hughes actually started looking at the situation. And what they realized was that the otter is that the crabs had been eating the snails and isopods and small invertebrates that were very good at hoovering up the algae on the blades of the eelgrass here. Um, and that the, by the otter coming in and, and, and eating those crabs, 
um, taking kind of keeping the crab population in control, that left these hooverers, the vacuum cleaners, the snails and, uh, and isopods and other snail-like organisms to keep the blades of the Zoster marina clean. And therefore it can photosynthesize healthily and um, expand and, and be robust. So this kind of um, more complicated trophic cascade was never anticipated. It wasn't even known that otter would live in estuaries, um, but because they've been gone so long, a lot of the history of its ecology is really still unknown. So it's to say that these estuaries, if we can um, return top predators, uh, if we can take really cl like close observation of how the estuaries are working, um, it's really, really important. So there's a whole chapter on the surf grass and the eelgrass in uh, the Curious World of Seaweed. This is kind of the introductory page. And you have the Zostra marina on the right. And then another um, uh, marine grass, the surf grass called Phyllospadix scolari, scolari actually, um, which is a surf grass that migrates. So these are not algae, they are grasses. They're flowering plants. So those are rhizome like root structures there. And they migrated back from land into the marine environment and the surf grass migrated out into the rough coastal area. So it gets pounded, it really likes the, the, the rough surf zone. So these are flowering plants. So what you have on the right is some of the seeds and the seeds have these interesting shape. And um, on the left, you have the textbook, a marine botany textbook by a wonderful um, seaweed scientist named E. Yale Dawson. And he did these incredible drawings. And you can see how the seeds are designed to catch onto the corallin algae so that they can then stay in one place to let those roots uh, go down. Um, and um, it's quite a remarkable thing. And then I had a lot of fun playing with my eelgrass scan mixed with this wonderful illustration from E. Yale Dawson's um, uh, botanical text. And this is where I just have so much fun. Um, now back to the algae. So those, those, those seagrasses, super important. They're flowering plants at the bottom here. You can see the flower down at the bottom, but the surf grass has an algal epiphyte. Uh, that's the seaweed that will grow only on the surf grass. And it's called smithora and it's this beautiful, delicate red seaweed. And the spores of the smithora will only stick to these thin blades of the surf grass, kind of one of those remarkable things. Um, so now we're just gonna go through some of some beauty uh, and then we'll get to the end and you can ask some questions. Um, this is a beautiful red seaweed called Weeksia and it was collected by the Mrs. J.M. Weeks. So she's one of the characters that you'll find threading through uh, my book. Um, and she finally had uh, this particular seaweed named after her. Um, uh, she was a collector in the 1880s. Uh, and this is the Postelsia or sea palm, very iconic California seaweed. Uh, it grows in the roughest of the rough zone. It loves to get pounded. It really is like little miniature palm trees or truffula trees. Um, and I've placed it against uh, one of these historic lithographs. Um, it's uh, had a wonderful story. It made it onto the cover of this uh, book, uh, which is a yearbook um, from 1901 called Postelsia. It was the yearbook of the Minnesota Seaside Station. And the Minnesota Seaside Station was started by a wonderful woman named Josephine Tilden. And it was located on the west coast of um, Vancouver Island. So I will let you follow that story um, in the book itself. It's really, she's Josephine Tilden, again, another fantastic pioneering woman. And this is the coral and algae. And it's worth really taking time to look at these. And the coral and algae are in all of the world's oceans. Um, on rocky reefs, they're very foundational. So you have two kinds of coral and algae. You have encrusting corallin, which is what I'm showing you encrusting on this bottle, but typically you would see it encrusting on the rocks. Uh, and if you see a pink undertone, uh, if you're even watching a documentary like my octopus teacher, if you see, or any other ocean-based documentaries, if you see this kind of pink undertone to a reef or a kelp forest, it's the corallin algae that are under there. And then there's the articulated corallin, which is on the left here, which is these bony, um, uh, branching structures. Now, the coral and algae have taken a different tactic against 
uh, uh, towards protecting themselves from herbivory, from being eaten by all those herbivores that we've been talking about. And they actually calcify in their cell walls. Um, it's just not as tasty to crunch into calcium carbonate than those luscious seaweed blades. Um, but as a result, they grow quite slowly. It takes a lot of energy to, to calcify. Um, but they are in the red seaweeds and that in the red seaweed category. And that is why they have these wonderful pink tinges. So I really challenge you all to see if you can find some sign of the coral and algae out when you're out um, walking the beaches. Um, it can be bleached if it's broken off and washed up on the shore. It uh, will bleach to white and it feels very bony. It's very delicate. Um, and this is the great agarum. So agarum is called colander kelp because it's naturally holy. Uh, and this, I've overlaid a whole bunch of different specimens, uh, but the brownish golden specimen is a specimen that was found out in the middle of Penobscot Bay. Um, it was kind of a long story that if you read the book, um, I'll let you read, but an anchor was being pulled up and you know, there's that automatic response of throwing all that detritus off of the anchor. And there was this beautiful colander kelp um, lodged in the anchor the blades of the anchor and I reached over and saved it before it was thrown back overboard. Now colander kelp or agarum is one of the very few species of seaweed or kelp in this case that has evolved that evolved down both coasts of North America. So it started in the Arctic Ocean and came down both the Pacific coast and the Atlantic coast. So um, this agarum fimbriatum is found um, or there's Clathratus, there's like three different agarums. Uh, it's, that's the genus name, but it is common here uh, in uh, the Gulf of Maine. It's a deep water kelp, so you have to find it washed up or broken off the bottom. Um, and it was named, this has got a whole historical thing. I kind of will leave this, but the very first specimens that were named were actually collected by George Steller in the, 18, in, um, in the 1740s. And then those specimens uh, went across the entire continent of Siberia, of, of Russia, and got to the Russian Academy of Sciences, where a generation later they were found and described by this very precocious young scientist named uh, Samuel Gottlieb Gmelin, again, a German in the Russian Academy of Sciences. And he uh, made these images for his Flora Fucorum, the very first book that described the seaweeds as a discrete corner. Uh, so that really began the, the, um, the studying of the seaweeds themselves. And then a uh, hundred years later in 1840, um, uh, Postels in that, in that Illustraciones del Garum made these incredible lithographs of these agarum that he just uh, found uh, on that expeditionary, ex uh, that um, expedition to Alaska. So these are Alaskan agarum and he named this one Gamalini after Gamalin. Anyway, all sorts of cool stuff. I love, so I love that the specimens kind of transport us across time and place. Uh, I think that's what this imagery is doing. That's what I'm trying to do with both my writing and uh, the imagery that I'm doing. Uh, so here, this is an image where I'm bringing my scan together with historical stuff and interweaving it with other uh, imagery. And this is an image that actually has been made into one of my scarves. Um, so I have a whole series of scarves that uh, the designs are uh, variations of the seaweed scans and, and, and sea glass scans uh, that have been in my books. And then I'll finish, this is the very last slide. And I call this image five foundational kelp. Um, and what you have here is on the left, on the very left there, that is the sugar kelp or uh, Saccharina latissima, which is the, the kelp that is being farmed that is native to our main coast here and is really the farmed kelp. It's what's easy to farm, it's easy to grow and it creates all this biomass very quickly. Um, uh, and it's beautiful when you find it floating around. Um, it's just, and you pull it out and you hold it up to the sky. It's just got this fantastic glow to it. Um, and the next one to the left is uh, kombu, actually. It's known as, uh, it's common, the Japanese name is kombu. It's laminaria, um, laminaria um, sechelii, named after sechel. Um, and it's this beautiful brown, brown, brown kelp. Um, and it used to be called digitata. So this is also, there's a very similar one. There's an Atlantic version and a 
um, Pacific version. So Laminaria digitata, kind of like fingers, um, is these where these blades come off. Then the very middle one is a juvenile egregia or feather boa kelp, which I talked about earlier. The next one is the great bull kelp. Um, and then on the end is a beautiful specimen, big specimen of something called five ribbed kelp or Costaria costata. And this was done as a possible, as a proposal for a mural um, at, a, um, at a law school in uh, San Francisco that was um, uh, redoing a, their lobby. And an art consultant came to me and said, would you propose something for the, um, for the lobby, and I thought, wouldn't it be really cool for law students, who, there's a really good environmental law program at this school, wouldn't it be good for them to look at five foundational kelp as opposed to the founding fathers? Um, you know, kind of change, again, I think it's how do we change mindsets about how we think about our natural world, and you have to take every opportunity you can. So this is where I end. I want to just say, please be in touch with me if you um, want to have ongoing conversations. Uh, my website has all sorts of you know, different pages. There's a books page and a scarf page and um, uh, prints. Uh, and then I am on Instagram and I really do have fun on Instagram. So follow along, please. And uh, my email is there as well. So um, with that, uh, maybe I will stop sharing and we can go to some questions. Absolutely. I know that um, Kelly had several questions. Kelly, if you would like to unmute yourself and feel free to ask um, any of your questions. Some things might have been answered along the way. Kelly, are you still with us? I see Kelly's iPad. I see Kelly's iPad too, yes. Well, one of her questions was, um, with the image of the eelgrass, it had a lot of the little lines, the structure within the eelgrass. What was that? Was that the cell walls within the grass? So it's, um, it's an actual plant. So I don't think I'm able to see to the level of the cell walls, but I think that some of the structure of, um, of transport, some of the transport structure. I'm not a huge um, eelgrass expert. Um, and those were taken from the lab of a really interesting scientist um, named Kathy Boyer, who's doing all sorts of eelgrass restoration in the San Francisco Bay. Um, so I apologize that I'm not as up on my eelgrass um, uh, structures, but I think it is, um, I don't think we're seeing the cell walls there. I don't think I'm that quite that close in. Okay, thank you. I, but I do get really good resolution from my scanner. Yeah, the images are absolutely breathtaking. Mm -hmm. And um, Tom had asked a question in terms of climate change and how, you know, is seaweed being affected? And you had mentioned um, that it grows really well in cold water. So what are, what are the projections? You know, we know that the waters are warming. Yeah, no, the water, and I can't stress enough how important cold water is for uh, the seaweeds and kelps. And I think what's going on right now is, I mean, there's, all, there's so much going on. It's kind of exciting. What I've actually experienced just in the last six years, seven years that I've been writing and researching seaweed is that all of a sudden, you know, there's this realization, ooh, maybe we better think about them. So there's all sorts of funding for all sorts of, um, but p there's a lot of study of the biogeography of the seaweeds. Are they migrating north? Are species that would be really kept down typically say in Southern California, are they moving up towards colder waters and the, the migration up towards Alaska. So um, the, the ocean waters though can cycle differently than, I mean, they are absorbing and warming generally. And we, are, we know we're gonna get more ocean heat waves that are, can be so destructive to the kelp forest. But, so I think part of the question is, how do we put resilience back? How do we make sure that our actions, whether it's fishing or research, um, 
how do we make sure we're putting resilience back into the system as opposed to pulling it out? And uh, there are all sorts of efforts going on in terms of culling urchins on the West Coast, um, on ranching urchins, on uh, creating different economies, but also really trying to learn more. There's so much about, say, the bull kelp, for instance. I, you know, I mentioned that alternate generation. People don't know how long those uh, spores and gametophytes can actually last under there. They actually might be a pretty good spore bank that just need um, some opening. You know, the bull kelp is very much of an opportunist um, in terms of, of where it grows. So I think that a lot, there's, there's so much different work going on. Of course, we have to be aware of how important cold oceans are and do whatever we can to keep CO2 levels as low as we can and all, all that direction. But um, there's also, I think, thinking about resilience and our job and how, ba how bad, just acknowledge how bad we've been um, in terms of pulling resilience out. These ecologies can't bounce back. They, they've evolved to have all these, this redundancy and systems in place to address big stressors like a marine heat wave. El Nino's come, you know, the 200 year storms come, a volcano could erupt and, you know, cover the oceans. These are all natural events that these, the fish populations and the seaweeds have all evolved, you know, all that resiliency um, is, to, is to kind of overcome those, those major events. So I'm not sure that's, that's kind of a long-winded answer, but um, that's where I'm, I'm really looking towards using the seaweeds, the bull kelp in particular, to tell this story about, this historical story about our acknowledging like, you know, is the fishery system working? You know, is it, is it working to, to put, is it putting resiliency back into our, our, our fish stocks and our seaweed pop, you know, kelp forests? Um, so I think that's what we need to think about now is how we put resiliency back in and not just say, oh, it's sustainable. Well, sustainable kind of means you're just keeping the status quo. We need to kind of go, maybe we need to leave more fish, you know, more. Um, anyway, that's, <laughs> I could go on and on <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? If so, um, this is your opportunity to unmute and ask. If not, I think we will um, come to a close of our program. Josie, we cannot thank you enough. Your presentation was just spectacular. I learned so much. The imagery is just breathtaking and um, you definitely have a gift. And I love just how you weave the history of, um, you know, of the science with your art is just, it's just really a very, very special. So a lot of people in the chat sending lots of thank yous uh, to you. Um, I want to let our audience know that our next program is actually going to be in person on uh, Monday, August 9th at 7 p.m. at the Ocean View Grange um, in Tenants Harbor. And uh, the topic will be the history of Port Clyde. And we'll have a, a panel of um, two Port Clyde families that are multi-generational families. Uh, very involved in the lobster and fishing industry. So it will be a really fun night and just keep an eye out for more information. Uh, Josie and others, if you're in Port Clyde, please come and visit us and just keep an eye on other programs that we have. We'd love to have you uh, be more involved. So thank you everyone and good night. Thank you. I really, really enjoyed being here and you guys are doing awesome, awesome work. So thank so you. glad to be a part of it. Thank, Thank you. you so much.